Well, it's actually take one. It's live. So we're going to take two live. www.thepowervoices.com. Justin Serrero back on the air with you. Lee Michaels in the studio. We're doing our thing here. And uh, I, I decided that I'm going to go mobile. I'm going to go out here in, in Hollywood today. I'm going to broadcast live from Hollywood on two platforms, www.thepowervoices.com and on our Facebook Live page slash Jesse Terrero and on our Facebook Live page off of thepowervoices.com as well as our YouTube Live page. Uh, I'm going to be, uh, we're going to be on there now. In fact, we're on there right now. I shouldn't walk across the street here, but the, the big hand says don't walk across the street. So I guess that means I... I can't walk across the street. So anyway, we are broadcasting live out here from the community to the world and all of Southern California, from the deserts to the sea and all of Southern California. I feel like I'm Jerry Dumphy. And if you don't know who Jerry Dumphy is and you're an L.A. resident for a long time, he was the the anchor newsman for KABC Channel 7 News for the longest time. And he always used to open up his broadcast saying, from the desert to the sea and all of Southern California, it's Eyewitness News on Channel 7, KABC. I'm Jerry Dunphy. So, you know, I, I'm not going to do that, but uh, that's what he always used to say. All right, we're getting our bearings here. It's a little scattered as we kind of set things up because today what we're going to be talking about is something that I think is really very interesting. As I walk down the street here, I, I'm holding two cameras at the same time. It's amazing for those on our Facebook page, on ABTV Live and our digital broadcasting network, and for those on our Power of Voices page at www.thepowervoices.com. All right, so we're also broadcasting live on our global digital radio format at thepowervoices.com. And so we welcome you along and we welcome you aboard. And we appreciate chiming in like you do, and calling from time to time at 424-227-9461. So I'm not going to worry too much about my car, because the security guy thinks that I probably went into Denny's. So I think I'm okay there. I look like I was kind of going into Denny's in that respect. So I'm all, I'm all right. I think I, my car won't be towed, and if it is, you're going to see the first live broadcast of a TV and radio host have a complete mental breakdown because his car was towed. Huh. I hope that doesn't happen. So there's so much violence and so much mayhem and so much just craziness in this world. Uh, we've been talking about a lot of that here on the radio station, as well as on our TV and our digital formats. There's so much of that going on right now that it's really disconcerting. Uh, we have become a, a really kind of a violent society in a lot of ways, um, where violence seems to be the way people try to solve their problems uh, most of the time. And unfortunate as it may be, uh, it seems like that trend is getting stronger and stronger and stronger every day, more powerful and more powerful every day. And what do we do about it as a society? What can we really do about it when these, these violent acts just pop out when we're at the store or at the bank or a festival or we're just trying to have a good time with our families? How do we get and be safe? How do we keep our our families safe? How do we keep ourselves safe? I think in these types of uh, man-made disasters like this, we have to be very uh, conscientious uh, about our surroundings all the time now. We have to keep our heads on a swivel left and right, left and right, sort of kind of a military understanding. You got to check your six all the time and what's going on behind you because uh, you just never know what's happening around the environment around you now. And one of the other things that we have to do always to keep ourselves safe from man-made disasters 
uh, that we've been seeing all across the country now popping up, it seems like, by the dozens on the news, the regular news. I think they're perpetrating that to, to some degree on purpose for some ulterior motive or outside objective. Uh, and I, I think that, uh, nevertheless, what's happening is, is we in the public, we are among other people, and we can't just isolate ourselves in a cave and grow a beard down to our belly buttons and our hair down to our rear ends. We can't just isolate ourselves uh, and become, you know, mountain men of the past and mountain women. We can't just move to Alaska and start living off the land like you see on those reality shows. We really have to, for better or worse, uh, get along with our fellow man. We really have to find a way to be able to coexist together with very different ideal patterns. We all have them, and they're all so vastly different than each other's. And that's part of the human quality, and that's what's part of what makes humanity so darn interesting, is that we just don't all react the same way to everything. But in those differences, what seems to be happening more and more and more is people are becoming more fearful of themselves and others because they aren't the same. They don't think the same. They don't look the same. They don't act the same. People are, people are looking at that and saying, you know, I'm, I'm afraid to talk to that person. I'm afraid to communicate. I'm afraid to, to be able to engage. Rightfully so with what's happening in our entertainment world and all the violence on these movies and reality TV violence and and in our music world, in our literature world, the news world, the sports world, violence seems to be the call of the day. Seems like New York, like we used to say, where all the advertising agencies were, no longer they are there. They're spread out everywhere now because of the technology. But it seems like that's what they want. It seems like that sells items, that sells products and materials and supplies. So when you think about it, you have to ask yourself, you know, where do you and how do you and what do you do to keep yourself safe against man-made disasters? As I was saying, you got to always keep your head on the swivel, looking left and right. And if you're watching us on www.thepowervoices.com, we are out here on Sunset Boulevard right now right across the street from the world-famous Palladium uh, Theater. And uh, we're out here broadcasting live as I'm sort of walking the streets uh, with, uh, with, um, with, uh, with, with folks hanging around. So we're going to engage some people out here on the corner of Sunset and Vine, which is just behind me, just behind me. See a lot of guys walking around with sports attire because it's the ESPY Awards tonight, I believe, here in Hollywood. And a lot of cats walking around with sports attire right now. But anyhow, the reason why I wanted to come out here because I wanted to talk about what happens in natural-made disasters. How do you keep yourself safe? We know about man-made disasters. In a lot of ways, we just try to stay clear and, and keep a level head and keep our eyes up our attention span up, be smart, always look around, be observant, watch people uh, while you're engaging them, keep a little bit away from them, three, four, five feet, and don't let people invade your space. All of those things that you learn growing up living in a major city like the city of Los Angeles. But what do we do in a natural made disaster. How do we protect ourselves in a natural made disaster? Like if you're on the East Coast, real cold temperatures in the wintertime, or flooding. The East Coast gets a lot of flooding because when the Atlantic Ocean swells and the hurricanes hit, what happens is the ocean rises. 
And most of the East Coast is very flat as you come in from the Atlantic Ocean. It's, it's a much longer flat zone than it is on the West Coast, the Pacific Coast. So there's lots of natural flooding that takes place. And we saw that in the different hurricanes that affect South Carolina, New Jersey, North Carolina, as they come up through the Gulf of Mexico. So how do you protect yourself against these kinds of disasters? And you're in the Midwest, we have tornadoes. And they have Tornado Alley, which is, produces hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of tornadoes a year. I mean, not just one or two. We only get it in the news reported to us when it's, when it's a five-plus tornado, one of those really giant ones that are a mile and a half wide and are just churning up everything in its way. How do we protect ourselves against natural-made disasters? How do we protect ourselves against the disasters that here on the West Coast, earthquakes? What do we do? We have the huge San Andreas Fault that runs way from the tip of uh, Oregon and Washington. We have the San Andreas Fault that, that comes all the way down into California and down into Mexico and into the Pacific Ocean. It's so where the two continental plates meet. One's going one way and one is going the other way. It's getting a little windy here, I know. So I'm going to kind of block the wind a little bit. I'm at the corner of Sunset and Vine as I kind of walk the street here and find a place over here by a fountain to sit down and continue chatting about what we do to protect ourselves. So you can kind of get a see, a look-see, if you're um, We've got that's, uh, that sunset pointed that way. This is sunset pointed that way. You can see those tall buildings right there. And these different tall buildings, people living on the third floor. You have these older tall buildings right there. You can see those as we look up Vine towards Hollywood and Vine, one of the most famous boulevards in the world. Then you have, this is actually the corner of Sunset and Vine right here. It's a very high tourist area. You've got the... Uh, uh, the Pacifica Theater is down there where they do a lot of, of uh, red carpets. And I do a lot of red carpets down there uh, over here at the Arclight Theaters. So you got people all milling around. You got a really tall building there. You can see that tall building. They just rebuilt that building about five or six years ago. It's all glass. Beautiful building. I haven't been up there since they rebuilt it. Love to go up there. So you can see this tall building right here. This was all, this building here was known as the Motown building for a long time. Up on top, the top three floors were Motown when they moved from Detroit. Barry Gordy moved them here. And right below was KISS FM originally. That's a big radio station here on the West Coast. They're always top two or three or four over the years. I worked there at KISS FM and KISS AM a long time ago, worked there for a while. Another tall building. So you see tall buildings all the way around. And this is just Sunset and Vine. You see the CNN building over there in the distance. You can check that out there. There are a lot of TV stations, radio station antennae up on the top over there as I kind of move off over the corner. So you got a lot of tall buildings. And then the original buildings and a skyscraper uh, crane that's going to be building a, a super huge building, about a 20-story building there. So that's going to be one of the tallest buildings. And this beautiful fountain. I'm going to hang out here just for, for a little bit as I kind of give you a little bit of the panoramic view of where I'm at here on the corner of Sunset Vine on the Jesse T Show today, live at 5, straight on the point. Um, more people kind of just walking down the street here. There are all the traffic down there and, and a lot of places to eat. A lot of young people who are in the entertainment business. Now this corner that I'm standing on right here, Chase Bank, this was the original NBC when they transformed, when they came from the East Coast to the West Coast. This is where NBC uh, was built. Uh, the NBC studios eventually moved over to Burbank. 
And uh, I'm going to walk around right here for a second just to give you a little more bearings. If you've never been to Hollywood, for those that haven't been here, um, and uh, those that have been here, of course, you've got the stars, the stars right here. And these are the stars they talk about. Helen Costello. This is, you know, Neil Sedaka, great uh, recording artist. Um, and uh, Quincy Jones right here. This is Quincy Jones, his star. You can kind of see that right there. Spike Jones, he was a, a comedian, recording artist, the Beach Boys. So you can kind of get a see of where I'm at. Now, NBC was, was right here on the corner of this building right here. This was the NBC corner. And it went all the way down, all the way down, all the way down, all the way down to that green light, way down there. You see that green light? That was the other corner where NBC Studios were. And they went all the way over. You see those townhouses right there? That was uh, NBC Studios uh, all the way over to that tall building, just on the other side of that tall building. Now, right over here, you'll see this new structures here. But then you'll see kind of an old Art Deco building with a, with a billboard that's no longer being used. They, they took it down, but they're going to be repairing it and putting some more neon signs. A lot of billboards here uh, in Hollywood, Coors Light, BFG movie. Um, they all light up at night. The original Broadway is down on the corner not too far from here. Uh, and that building there was originally a, a, a theater. Uh, it was part of the Pacifica Theater Group back in the 1930s, that Art Deco kind of building. And the great talk show host, TV talk show host, Merv Griffith, he owned that building. In fact, he owned this whole corner at one time across the street of what was NBC. All right, so that's kind of where I'm at. And the reason why I'm showing you this, because I, I got to thinking with all this crazy violence that's going on in our world today and all of this, this mayhem that's man-made, what do we do in a natural disaster, what would you do if there was a, here in California, an eight point earthquake that hit right now, just a few minutes, right now, and it lasted just a few minutes, what would you do? I'm gonna sit down right here for a moment. Hopefully the sun won't be too bright. So what would, what would we do, okay, in that respect? All these buildings will come crashing down the glass would become spiraling down and breaking on the ground and on cars and people's heads. The streets would be uprooted. What would we do if we had a major eight-point earthquake? Water mains and fires would burst. People would be in complete, absolute panic. They wouldn't know what to do, where to go, how to get anywhere. Uh, there would be a lot of people injured. Emergency facilities would be overrun. In fact, the mayor of Los Angeles, a couple of years ago, I kind of worked on this project indirectly. It was, it was his plan to be able to uh, put together an emergency preparedness plan for the city of Los Angeles. And one of the things that they needed to do in order to offset what would have been a terrible, terrible emergency uh, in terms of an eight or seven or eight point earthquake. And it's a, it's a heck of a report. It's about 200, 250, 300 pages. And it really outlines what the city has to do in order to prepare itself and its citizens and what citizens should be doing to help prepare themselves uh, when emergency services don't arrive. So what would you do in a natural disaster where you live? Are you prepared for a natural disaster? Are you ready? for the worst case scenario. So I want to talk a little bit about that today on the Jesse T Show, Live at Five. We've been talking about a lot of the very unsettling things that are happening in our country today. So I thought it was about time we talk about some things that can help everybody in a natural disaster or even a man-made disaster. So let's go over what you should have and how you should be prepared. Now, I will tell you, I'm what's called a prepper. 
We've been prepping for the worst case disaster that you could possibly imagine ever in your mind for about, I would say, 10 years now. Five hardcore, 10 pretty much, but our whole lives, our family has been basically prepared for worst case disasters ever since I was born. And I'm in my 50s. So I kind of grew up with the mentality that you should be prepared and ready for the worst and pray to God that it never happens. And so that's what we're going to talk about today as I sit here in front of Chase Bank and, and this beautiful fountain right behind me. Look at that beautiful fountain. Isn't it gorgeous? Right over there. I should be actually sitting by that, shouldn't I? Yeah, I think I'm going to move over there. It's too hot right here. You know why? Because there's water. And I like water. We all like water. And that's the number one thing that we have to protect ourselves with is that we have to have running water. Running water is so very important. Now think about it. What if you were stuck in a major disaster for one month? The professionals tell us that we should be ready for at least a month on our own. I suggest you should be ready for a year. Because if a major disaster like here in California were to happen, at an eight-point earthquake, emergency services will be completely overrun. There will be no fire, there will be no doctors, there will be no police, there will be no ambulances that'll come for you. You're on your own. You're on your own to protect yourself, you're on your own to protect your family, and you're on your own to have water. Now, if all the water, like this beautiful fountain behind us, if all the water is gone and it's not working, and there's no running water, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? That's the question. So here's a suggestion. This is what I do. I have enough water to last me and my family for one year. We don't have to have any water from any outside sources for one year. You figure one person uses about a half a gallon of water a, year, a day. So you can imagine how many gallons of water we have. Now, all that isn't necessarily drinking water. Some of it is gray water. Drinking water is important, but also gray water is important because you have to wash yourself. Hygiene is very important in a natural disaster because if you get sick because of filth, you could die. It's that simple. So water. They say you should have a month's worth of water. So every time you go to the store, you should be buying those 24 packs of water bottles. Put a piece of wood on the bottom, not on cement, because the plastic will deteriorate, and put carcinogens in the water of the first row. And then start stacking those water bottles up. Put them in a closet, a dark, cool place in your garage, and don't tell anybody you have water. Because if you tell somebody when they don't have water, they're going to come knocking. And guess how many people will come knocking? All the people you tell and all the people they tell. And then that turns into a major problem for you. So water is important to have. You should have enough water that you're drinking enough water every day to suffice and survive. Now, you really only need, in worse and extreme cases, about one cup of water a day. Really, in extreme cases, you need about one good cup of water a day. You sip it. Your body just not, cannot get dehydrated. It cannot start overheating. Because if that happens, your body uses up more water. And what happens is you get sick and you die. So you have to be very careful as to how much water 
you are going to have saved. And that is you have to save enough so you don't get dehydrated. In an emergency situation, you are burning about 3,000 to 6,000 calories a day. So you have to have food. And if you think Walmart and Kmart and the markets are going to be able to survive the first four or five days and replenishing their warehouses with food, you are wrong. You've got to have food. You've got to have food on hand. With all the looting and the desperados that will take place, you have to have food. Now, there's a thing you can buy where food can last 25 years on the shelf at places like Costco and Sam's Price Club and Walmart. They sell these five gallon in jugs with enough food in there to last 30 days. It's dehydrated food and you just add a little bit of water. Water is so very important. All the water, you got to count on it being gone. So now you've got to have enough food. So if you're burning three to 6,000 calories a day under an emergency situation, that means you have to have enough food in order to replenish yourself so that you can continue to survive and maintain your safety and your family and your shelter and your surroundings. If you get sick because your malnutrition happens, you will die. It's that simple. So you have to have food. And you're not going to be able to get food nor water anywhere in an 8-point earthquake in California or a hurricane or a tornado. As so many folks know, the military and National Guard can only do so much. Well, here in the West Coast, in California, when the railroad tracks go down, they can't get in here and they can't possibly feed 20 million people with water and food. It's not going to happen. More riots, more killing, more looting is what's going to take place. So what you need to understand is that water and food are the two most important things that you can do for yourself. Every week, you should be buying a 24 pack of water. It costs three bucks. Save water. Now, obviously, you're not going to be able to carry all that water out if you have to leave your domicile. So you've got to make sure that you have enough water and enough water to travel with. Traveling is important because you just might have to leave where you live. If it becomes unsafe, unsanitary, or unhealthy, you're going to have to leave. So that means you're going to have to exit your safety place. So that's why you should have another place to go to that you can get to at any time, night or day, that nobody knows about. Now that's gonna be pretty hard when you're living in an urban society and all the bridges are down and there's no emergency services and people are attacking everybody for what? Their water and their food. So what do you do? You gotta start either investing in a secondary place to go or find somebody that has a secondary place to go and offer your services. If you're a doctor, a lawyer, a carpenter, an electrician, if you're a person who understands how to weld, you're a mechanic, these are services that you can offer and barter because money will be gone. The banks will be shut down. You will not be able to get one dollar out of your ATM machine. So this is why you have to have some silver. Silver is what you buy, or what they call dirty silver, or junk silver. Any coins between before 1965. Silver today is running about $20 an ounce. It's up a little bit because of the turmoil in the world and our country most, most, mostly. But it's been hovering at about $16 to $17 an ounce for about six years. One ounce is $16 to $17. Bucks. So one day a week, one time a week, you buy one silver coin. It costs you $20. 
That means in one month, you'll have 30 silver coins. 30 silver coins. If you buy one a day. If you buy one a week, you'll have four silver coins. Or amass 52 silver coins in one year. Or 365 silver coins if you buy one daily. Now, how many times do you waste twenty dollars a day going to 7-Eleven, getting a big gulp, a sandwich, a Slurpee, and a couple of gallons of gas. There's twenty bucks. You see that behind me? That won't be there for you. That ambulance, LA Fire Department, that will not be there. That will not be existing. Do you think that the police and fire are not going to go home and take care of their families? Come on now. Come on now. Do you think the National Guard is going to come in here and deal with the Crips and the Bloods and 18th Street and the gangs and the Armenian Mafia gangs? Come on now. Do you think that anybody is going to help anybody? Yes. But always remember, you have to protect yourself. You have to protect your water. You have to protect your food. You have to protect your silver. And you have to protect your domicile. If you're the only light on at night and three months have gone by and nothing has happened and the disaster has gotten worse, do you think that everybody within a square mile is going to know about your light on at night? Well, how are you doing that when no one else can have electricity? They are going to know that you have a generator. And if you think for one second, they're just going to come over and ask, hey, can we spend the night in your front yard? Mm. They're going to take your generator. So now you have to defend your castle. Your domicile. That means you have to have weapons. Weapons are very important, whether you're pro gun or not. In a natural disaster, when you're on your own for a long period of time, you better be able to protect yourself. Do you think the terrorist group Black Lives Matter is going to care about your life? Do you think the KKK is going to care about your life? Do you think the Crips and the Bloods? And the biker gangs, the Hells Angels, the Mongols, and the Vargos are going to care about your life? Do you think that 18th Street MS-13 are going to care about your life? Do you think that the prisoners that have been left out of prison under Proposition 47 here in the state of California, who are released early, are going to care about your life? Do you think that anybody is going to care about your life? If you think so, then you're not going to have much of a life for too long. You have to care about your own. And let me tell you, you don't take a knife to a gunfight. So you have to have a weapon, get licensed for it, and be proficient with it. It's very important that you are licensed and proficient with your weapon. You have to have the ammunition to take care of that weapon. You have to know how to clean it. And don't tell anybody you have it. You should have a pistol, a shotgun, and a rifle. And your whole family should be proficient at it. If they aren't, when you die, they're not going to know what to do. So they should learn alongside of you. Whether you are pro-gun or not, you should have some weapons and ammunition to protect your home, your family, your food, your silver, and your water. If you don't, you are going to die. It's that simple. Also, what you need to know is you have to have transportation. Adequate transportation to get you the heck out of Dodge. Because if you're stuck here in the city, any city where you're at, for any length of time, two, three months, without any kind of help, I think it's time to leave. 
During the L.A. riots here in 64, looting, destruction, burning, all happened down in South Central L.A. in Compton. During the riots of Rodney King, they happened too. The police decided to just cordon off the whole area of South Central L.A. and not go in. It was that simple. They didn't go in because they knew they were being outmanned and outgunned by the citizens that had weapons. So if you think the police, even if they're there, are going to help you, you have another question. Do you want to live or die? It's that simple. God will not save you. Allah will not save you. Buddha will not save you. The Hindi prophets will not save you. Jehovah will not save you. The spirits of the world will not save you. They will give you the intelligence to listen to what I'm saying so that you can make a choice to save yourself and your family. That simple. Get out of Dodge if you can. Find a place to go to that's away from the mass population and problems that are going to take place. As we get up and walk a little bit now, as I walk up Vine, we're going to see what would happen, just what would happen if all the people that I'm walking by decided that and there was a major disaster. Do you think any of these people would help anybody for that matter? Do you think any of these people here would really care? Do you think any of these people that, that you see going by are going, to, are going to help the situation? What do you think? Do you think any of these people on any side of the street are going to come to your benefit? Oh, yeah. Some of them will. Absolutely. But after time goes on, they got to get home to take care of their families. And if they got to pick their families over you, you lose and you're going to die. It's that simple. Medicine. If you have a medical condition, you better have enough medicine to survive or you're going to die. Bandages, Bactine, Vaseline, sutures. You better have a medical kit in your house that's equal at least to a military medics kit, at least minimally. If you don't, you're going to get an infection. When you slip and fall and cut yourself, there will be no hospitals and you will get an infection and you will die. It's that simple. Do you think any of these people, if this stuff was crashing down on us today right now, are going to come here and pull you out of the way? Yeah. I think that some of them will. I absolutely do. But do you think they're going to pick themselves first to save themselves and then their families? You have to look out for yourself. You can't allow anybody to look out for you. Also, what you're going to need is clothing. Clothing for all weather types. Summer, winter, rain, spring, fall. You need to have the proper clothing. If you don't, you're going to die. That's what will happen. See, the result of not being prepared and under duress for a long period of time, like let's say more than a month, just means that if you do not prepare yourself, the final result is you're going to die or be very sick or be very incapacitated. The projections are that in a major disaster, as I walk up Sunset Boulevard here, I'm walking up, actually I'm walking up Vine. Oh, my car is still there. I'm actually walking up Vine. Uh, and I'm gonna go up to uh, Hollywood and Vine, and then cross over and come back around the corner to my car. But the projections are that at least a third of the population in California under a major disaster of an eight-point earthquake are going to die. 
That's 10 million people. Yep, 10 million people. And there's nothing that the United States military is going to be able to do about it. When there's no electricity, there's no gas, there's no water, there's no power, there's no emergency services, what are you going to do? You're going to run to your church? They don't have it either. What are you going to do? When the centers are overworld, and if you think I'm goofing you or lying, Katrina, everybody was told to go to the dome in, in, in Texas. And what happened there? Rapes and murders, robberies and beatings. A lot of people died and got hurt. You see, no matter what emergency plans are in place, they will not be able to take care of 12 million people. It's just an impossibility, which means that you're going to have to take care of yourself. And if you're not prepared, you're going to die. I keep saying that over and over, because what I'm trying to impose upon your thought is the fact that this could happen at any second in your existence. This emergency could happen at any moment, at any time, anywhere. And you've got to be prepared. What am I going to do if there's an earthquake right now? And this tall building that I'm walking under, it's called the Taft building. What am I going to do if there's an earthquake that knocks me to my butt? Knocks me to my butt. Because an eight point earthquake will knock you off your feet. And you will not be able to walk until it stops. Look at this building. Right above me. You see that facade way up there on top? What happens when that crashes down? They rebuilt this building a few years ago and made it all earthquake proof. But it's not earthquake proof. Nothing really is. That comes crashing down. What if I'm knocked on my butt and I can't get up and that facade up there comes crashing down? What do you think is going to happen? I'm going to die. If I don't, I'm going to get injured most likely. And if I get injured and nobody helps me and I break my leg or my arm is broken, I'm going to die. <laughs> it's just that simple. It's not a funny thing, but I don't think you're prepared. I don't think anybody is prepared, quite honestly. I really don't. I think that everybody is ill-prepared because I talk to a lot of people about earthquake preparation and nobody is ready. You better have an axe. You better have a knife. You better have utensils. You better have water purification systems like water purification drops, water purification pills, a water purification filter. Now, now I'm at the world-famous corner, guys. This is Hollywood and Vine. See, that's Hollywood Boulevard down there. That's where we did the Ghostbusters red carpet premiere last Saturday, way down there at the Chinese Theater. And that's where we were last Saturday. And we do a lot of those red carpet premieres. You can catch it on AVTV Live, the digital broadcasting network, facebook.com forward slash Jesse Torero. Also, you're listening to www.thepowerofvoices.com. And go to our YouTube Live. We're streaming live on Stream Up, YouTube Live, thepowervoices.com, Facebook site, as well as you now and so many others like Periscope and Livestream and on our digital broadcasting network, facebook.com forward slash Jesse Torero. This used to be the Broadway store right here on the corner. This is the Broadway store. It's a restaurant and office buildings now. That was the Broadway store. The Brown Derby used to be right there. You see any kind of historical Hollywood programs on that corner over there where the red parking lot flag is, the Brown Derby was there. That big building behind there, that was the world famous Knickerbocker Hotel. And the Knickerbocker Hotel goes back all the way to the 1920s. This building here was one of the first office buildings. It was called, it's, it's called Hollywood and Vine, but it was one of the first office buildings and bank buildings here in Hollywood. It's a very distinguished building and a lot of business dealings in there the 1920s and the 1930s. Pretty amazing building. 
And what they've done here, right down the way over here, you see that red building? That's a relatively new building. But just on the other side of that red building, you might be able to see the awning where that green light is. That place is known as the palace. It's known as um, Babylon now. But that's where Milton Berle and Frank Sinatra and so many other shows were broadcast from uh, for 20 years. That was a broadcast facility for TV. Because remember, NBC was just down the street that way for many decades. And then they moved over to Burbank uh, in, across the, the mountains there. So this is the corner of the world famous Hollywood and Vine. You can see more stars here, more stars, more stars, Tom, Tom Brennan, Warren Baxter. A lot of these stars are the older stars because these were some of the first stars that were put in. Jim Davis, Catherine Hepburn, just great names. But what do you think is going to happen if there was an earthquake and all these people around here got hit with an earthquake and then they all jumped in their cars and the subway here to try to get home and they couldn't get home and they're stuck here and most people here in Los Angeles are commuters they commute 50 60 70 80 miles a day what do you think is going to happen to them when they can't get home I hope they have a backpack in their car or they have some facility in their pockets or purses to allow them to survive to get home because you see, unfortunately, the police and sheriff are not going to be here. That frolic room is a great old, old time Hollywood bar kind of room. This is a world famous Pantages Theater. It was not originally known as the Pantages Theater. They changed the name to the Pantages Theater later on. Uh, you can see right here through the building, it's a Capitol building, Capitol Records building. They no longer make uh, music at Capitol Records. That basically is a giant uh, library and offices for what is now part of Capitol Records, but a conglomerate of about nine different record companies that came together. In that parking lot down below is where Frank Sinatra and Count Basie did all of their great music. They did it in the great studios down there and had such a resonant sound because it was underground and it was built like a bunker. So it was really something to bestow. So when you start looking here, this is the W Hotel. This is a new hotel here in Los Angeles and in Hollywood. They do a lot of celebrity red carpets here. The LA County Sheriff is here doing their thing and uh, in that respect. So, you know, if there is a major disaster going on here, the sheriffs are not going to be there because there's just not enough of them. So you're going to have to be on yourself. You're going to have to be there for yourself. And if you're not, and you aren't prepared, you're going to, that's right, die. That's really the bottom line here and the message I want to get across. Let me take a time check real quick. See, the important thing to understand is that in order to survive a man-made disaster, like the violence that's bestowing upon our nation right now, you have to be able to be observant, be skilled in watching, be skilled in being able to take care of yourself, get out of it, have a way of leaving. You have to be able to understand how to protect yourself, what to look for, not to be hanging around thinking that nothing is going to happen. Right here, just to give you an idea, they're building three giant skyscrapers right here. Amazing how Hollywood is changing. It is an amazing thing how Hollywood is changing. Which creates more possibility for disastrous things to take place. In a natural disaster, you never know when it's going to happen either. Here in California on the West Coast, earthquakes are the primary thing. On the East Coast, hurricanes, snowstorms, freezing temperatures. Those are things, rainstorms, flooding. In the Midwest, tornadoes and hurricanes and freezing temperatures. In the desert, no water, no shade, very boiling hot temperatures, 120 degrees, 115 degrees. See, disasters happen 
in all shapes and manners. The key, though, is for you to be prepared. So this is what you need to put together, a disaster preparedness kit. You can go online. You can buy them. You can go online and research what you should put in yours. But you buy a basic, very good disaster preparedness kit, and then you add to it in the needs that your family needs, baby wipes, protein bars, foods that last forever, MRIs, dehydrated food, all of these types of things you add to it. And then you buy a disaster kit for your home. And you put it in your garage, or put it in your closet, or put it in your bedroom. And you fill that up with water and food and medicine and the things we talked about. And you put an ax in there too, and a crowbar, and, and some lighting material, batteries, matches, candles, light sticks. You have to put all that in there. Shampoo, female hygiene products, male hygiene products. You've got to be prepared for these things. Baby products if you have a little one. Kids, shoes, socks, underwear. Really important. Soap. Washing soap for your own hands. Washing soap for your clothes. Also, you put in those kits, as well as that. Reading material, magazines, newspapers, books, medical books on how to survive, survival books, rattlesnake kits, uh, mosquito spray. You have to do these things. You have to learn how to survive. All the things that you take for granted, all the things that people take for granted, are not going to be there. They're going to be gone. And what's going to happen, if you're like these people behind me right there, who are not prepared, I guarantee you, they are going to die. That simple. You don't want to be one that dies. You want to be one that survives. You want to look at your ability and say, I can make it. I can take care of myself. I can take care of my family. I can do that for at least 90 days. At the end of 90 days, if no one's come, you've got to get out of Dodge. you got to find a place to go. Family members in other parts of the country. Better have enough fuel. Better have a vehicle that can get you there. Instead of buying a second car, buy a truck. A four-wheel drive truck of some nature. Doesn't have to be new. It just has to have four-wheel drive. So you can go on a back road. So you can get to someplace. I happen to have military vehicles. Why? Because I'm just a prepper. And I love military vehicles. I figure if I'm going to have to survive with a vehicle, I want a vehicle that allows our military men and women to help them survive. I've got an M35A2 Deuce. And I'm going to buy another one. You know why? Because they will help me not die. That's the key. Understand that you have to survive for a long period of time. God willing, you only have to survive for a couple of weeks. But you got to be prepared to survive for a long period of time. What you should do is team up. Team up with those that have skills that you don't have. You want to team up. See that young lady that just walked behind right past us? She's not ready. What if I was a bad guy and I just decided to punch her in the face and take her purse? Do you think that anybody around here would help? Do you think anybody around here would care? No, they wouldn't. You know why? Is because they don't know if I might kill them. That's right. So you see, you got to be ready and prepared for everything. Everything all the time. You got to keep your eyes up, your head up. Look back. Look left to right. Look at the tall buildings as you walk by them. Be ready for an earthquake to happen. Be ready for a drunk truck driver to lose his truck and fall asleep. Be ready for a car to blow out a couple of tires and crash onto the sidewalk. Be ready for that, that crazy maniacal maniac who just 
does it on purpose, like they did, like this old man did about 10 years ago at a farmer's market. About 80-year-old guy, he took his car and he drove it right into a crowd of people at farmer's market for no other reason, just because. He said he had a stroke. Maybe he did, but he's sitting in jail. And I don't even know if he's still alive anymore, but he's in jail. He killed a bunch of people. Disasters happen all the time, man-made and not. So my moral today is I want you to survive another day. So I wanted to come out to the Hollywood area, walk the streets, give you a different feel, let you know that we are on the point, baby. This is the Jesse T Show, live at five. As we get to the end, we got just a couple, let me do a time check. Yeah, I think we got about a minute left. I'll give you a couple of things that you should go. There are all kinds of websites to go preparedness in a Google search, and you'll get a lot of emergency preparedness sites. Look at the military sites and how they are prepared. Mimic yourself after the military. That's really important because they are in the business of surviving at all costs. So get a military manual on how to survive and how to make it all happen. That's what you need to do in terms of that. Okay? AV TV Live on your digital broadcasting network. This is Jesse Terrell and the Brown Beauty on www.thepowervoices.com. Every day from 5 to 6, right here Monday through Friday, wishing you the ability to survive Another day. The Brown Beauty is off duty. <laughs>